Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another New Jersey Constitutional Republican virtual conversation. And the New Jersey Constitutional Republicans are honored to welcome Professor Lucas Morrill to discuss his book, Lincoln and the American Founding. Thank you for joining us, Professor. Great to be here, JR. Just a little background. Lucas Morrell is the John K. Boardman Jr. Professor of Politics and the head of the Politics Department at Washington and Lee University. He holds a PhD in political science from Claremont Graduate University. Professor Morrell also teaches in the master's program in American history and government at Ashland University in Ohio, lectures in summer programs for the Claremont Institute for the study of statesmanship and political philosophy and conducts high school teacher workshops for the Gilder Lehrman Institute, John M. Ashbrook Center, Jack Miller Center, Bill of Rights Institute, and Liberty Fund. Professor Morrell is the author of Lincoln and the American Founding, which we'll be talking about today, published in 2020 for the Concise Lincoln Liberty Series of Southern Illinois University Press. Other publications include Lincoln's Sacred Effort, which we hope to have Dr. Morrell back for a discussion on that. Defining Religion's Role in American Government, Lincoln and Liberty, Wisdom for the Ages, Ralph Ellison and the Raft of Hope, a political companion to Invisible Man in the New Territory, Ralph Ellison and the 21st Century. Professor Morrell is a trustee, trustee of the Supreme Court Historical Society, former president of the Abraham Lincoln Institute, a consultant on the Library of Congress, exhibits on Lincoln in the Civil War, was a member of the scholarly board of advisors for the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission and currently serves on the U.S. Semi-Quincentinal Commission, which will plan activities to commemorate the founding of the United States of America. So that's a great uh, bio, uh, Professor Morrell, and again, we're happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Now, I would suggest that uh, if all of you, any re constitutional Republican, whether in New Jersey or throughout the nation, which is which will this broadcast will be uh, shown, needs to go out and get this, this book, uh, every constitutional Republican needs to have it. And we're going to discuss why this is such a great book. Uh, 162 pages, about what is it, 125 pages of uh, what you're writing, Professor. But yeah. uh, what a book. And, uh, and I was interested to know that I heard another interview that you were asked to actually talk about a different topic from the publisher, which was Abraham Lincoln and civil rights. But uh, you went in this direction. Yeah, um, they... Uh, if you study Lincoln to any uh, serious extent, you, you run into all the same people at the, at the various conferences. And so my, my name has gone around. And so out of the blue, I get an invitation to write for this series, the, the Concise Lincoln Library series of Southern Illinois University Press. The editor wanted me to write about Lincoln and civil rights. And I think it's because I teach a seminar on Lincoln and I teach a seminar on race and equality at Washington and Lee University. Uh, but I said, you know what, I don't really look at Lincoln from that kind of niche, you know, just civil rights. And I said, would you guys be interested in a book about Lincoln and the American founding? What it is that sh I believe shaped him more than any other influence. It's the American founding. And they said, ooh, founding. Uh, what, tell us about that. And, and that led to me <laughs> submitting a, a formal proposal. And then it took me too many years to write it because I have a day job. Um, and then I eventually got it done. Their editors were fantastic. And so that's how we got to Lincoln and the American founding. And as I said, if I haven't, there haven't been many scholarly uh, reviews of it yet. That takes a while, six to, to 18 months. But if the reviews are bad, I should find another line of work because pretty much that 125 pages is a distillation of what I believe is essential to know about Abraham Lincoln. Right, and of course, we're gonna focus on this book, but I do wanna encourage our uh, viewers uh, to go to YouTube and just type in uh, Dr. Or Professor Morell's um, name, and you're gonna come up with some great videos that he's already done and some great interviews. And one of the things that I wanted to share Professor was the great work he did with race in America and the colorblind constitution. Thank you. I believe you did at Hillsbury. It's a great uh, study and a thorough study. There's a lot of information that people uh, need to learn from that. And that is really an outstanding um, uh, effort on your part. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I recommend it to all. But anyway, anyway, let's get into the book. 
And uh, I thought the introduction was very interesting. Um, professor, you named two men normally not associated as being mentors of Lincoln. And one of them was John Quincy Adams. And the other one was James Madison. Of course, Quincy Adams was, uh, would, would, could we call him uh, accurately an abolitionist uh, right from the very beginning? He did have a great love for the Declaration of Independence, but how much of an influence do you think he was on Lincoln? Yeah, and Lincoln was actually in Congress the, the, the day that John Quincy Adams essentially fainted and, and, and died uh, mm -hmm. minutes later within the hour on the congressional floor. And my mentor, Harry Jaffa, once said it was as if it was a figurative passing of the baton from John Quincy Adams and his devotion to the Declaration of Independence, which shaped his anti-slavery convictions, to Lincoln, who that was the one term that Lincoln served in the Congress between 1847 and 1849. So what we don't find in Lincoln are direct references, explicit quoting of John Quincy Adams. But John Quincy Adams, of course, son of John Adams, our second president yeah. and a major influencer uh, of the, the American founding. Um, what we have in John Quincy Adams is a living legacy of the founding. And Lincoln was a great, as my book argues, uh, devotee of the founding. And so, um, as I said, we don't have a lot of explicit references. In fact, we don't have any uh, references where Lincoln is quoting John Quincy Adams outright. But the emphasis on the Declaration, and Adams wasn't the only one, but the emphasis on the Declaration of Independence um, was uh, certainly something that, that Lincoln took to. Right. And uh, he also, you have in the book, quote, no illusion in the Constitution, in addition, um, the fact that uh, those noble fathers who were respecting state authority over the institution of slavery made no illusion in the Constitution to slavery. And uh, you thought that was, that was, Lincoln thought that was significant that Madison made sure that that uh, language of slavery was not used in the Constitution. No, absolutely. And, and we know for a fact that Lincoln uh, read the debates that were made public after Madison died. This is something that folks, and I talk about original intent in my, in my last chapter. I don't spend a lot of time on it. Um, uh, it's kind of a given with Lincoln. If you're looking to the founding, you're looking to what did they originally intend? You think they're important. You don't look to them simply because they were first. You look to them because you think they're right or good or right. correct. If what they did was bad, <laughs> you'd want to correct it. But Lincoln didn't think there was anything to correct um, in, in spite of the fact that he recognized the Constitution had compromises. So he read Madison's notes. Oh, what I was going to say is a lot of people say, oh, we should read the Constitutional Convention notes to know what the meaning of the Constitution is. Madison did not even believe that. Madison mm -hmm. thought his, his notes had this much relevance to interpreting the Constitution. He, he, he wanted them um, uh, uh, published only after he died. He wanted the working out of the Constitution by the original generation that adopted mm -hmm. it. That's the American people, not what this person said from South Carolina or this person said from New Hampshire. It was the people's constitution. And so uh, Madison himself would be a different kind of original intent. The intent you would look for is not in the notes, but in the ratifying debates and in the speeches and pamphlets and conversations that ordinary Americans and extraordinary ones were having in the, 18, in the 1780s. But Lincoln, looking at the notes, learned from Madison, ah, it was deliberate. Because if you mm -hmm. look at the motions, especially from Southerners like Yancey of South Carolina, when they were talking yeah. about slavery, they used the word slave. They used the mm -hmm. word slavery and the constitutional um, delegates at, at, on final motion removed that language and always referred to them as persons. Because mm -hmm. Madison said he looked to the day where we could no longer have slavery. And he was a slaveholder. He mm -hmm. looked to the day where we would no longer have slavery in, in America, and he thought the Constitution shouldn't be stained by a constant reference to something that we intended to get rid of, okay? So Lincoln, Lincoln um, makes a lot of that, and so do the early abolitionists, Frederick Douglass, Garrett Smith, um, uh, those guys, not Garrison, <laughs> William Lloyd Garrison thought the Constitution was pro-slavery, but when Douglass came to the pro-liberty interpretation of the, of the Constitution, he said they never used the word slave. And so he believed right. the Constitution, a little more than Lincoln did, uh, didn't protect slavery. So that's, yeah, Lincoln definitely learned from Madison, whose birthday we just celebrated a day or two ago, I believe. That's right. 
And uh, we brought the, we've tried to bring out the fifth clause of the First Amendment, the, the right uh, to petition. And it's interesting that John Quincy Adams was putting that right to petition forth uh, in the Congress to abolish slavery, was he not? And then the gag rule was uh, created to, to shut him up. And ever since that, the, really the right of petition has kind of faded away and we think it needs to be restored as a, as a vehicle by which people can protect our natural rights. Yeah, and I don't talk about that one in my book, so I'm just gonna make my comment brief here. Um, Adams was a, right. a leader in trying to um, get Congress to um, re revoke this, you know, Congress sets its own rules. The House sets its rules, you know, this whole discussion of filibuster. Filibuster is not in the Constitution, that's up to the Senate. Right. That's up to the House. Right. The House would do it if they wanted. There's too many, there's no way they would do it. Um, but what Adams was, was complaining about was the, the gag rule, which occurred in the late 30s and early 40s, which said any motion in reference to the Congress's authority to abolish or touch slavery where it already exists gets immediately tabled. And if you know anything about parliamentary procedure, Robert right. was in order, if, if you wanna kill something, yeah. you don't vote it down, you just say, uh, I move to table. table and it's not debatable. It gets a second immediate vote and bang. So right. if so, it, that is just a sledgehammer. And so to adopt the gag rule meant mm -hmm. they didn't even get to read the petition, okay? Yeah. And so, but here's the difficulty. And I, I, you know, I, I try to make it a fair fight in my classes. So I'm gonna make this a fair fight. Um, right. to, if Congress, according to the constitution can only address slavery as it involves interstate, you know, commerce and right. uh, uh, non-importation, then, then talking about Congress's authority to abolish slavery is actually out of order. It is not mm -hmm. within the remit of Congress. And you'll see South Carolina's Senator John Calhoun leads the charge in 1837 saying, these are, these are out of order. We should not be hearing these at mm -hmm. all. So he was arguing for, of course, maintaining the gag rule. So anyway, mm -hmm. it's a, it's the, the debate is really interesting. Read both sides. Right. Well, thanks for touching on that, uh, Professor. But you end the uh, introduction to the book and you say that this book was written in hopes that Lincoln's lessons from the American founding still hold true today. And that is why this book is so relevant and so important for people to get. Thank and you. then we get into the first chapter. Uh, yeah, would you like to comment on that, Professor? Or, yeah, actually, because this book is very vital. Okay, let me, uh, can I at least just describe what the chapters are so we get a kind of a 30,000 foot perspective on it and then we Absolutely. can take as much time as you want on any particular chapter. So after the introduction, right. my book has five chapters. The first chapter is on, uh, I mean, it's, it's a book on Lincoln and the founding and you can't talk about the founding without talking about the founder and that's George Washington. Mm -hmm. He truly is that's the right. indispensable man. But for George Washington, the United States would not exist, okay? Uh, that's Lincoln's opinion. That's my opinion. That was many people's opinion, even when Washington was alive. So the first right. chapter, I look at the influence of Washington on Lincoln. The second chapter, however, and I say however, uh, because more important to Lincoln than any particular founder was a founding document or the founding ideas and those mm -hmm. he found uh, in the, the Declaration of Independence. And this was a chapter I almost divided into two because there were so many specific ideas from the declaration that Lincoln talked about uh, and was conversant with and, and tried to get the country to reclaim and come back to, uh, then I ultimately said, no, I couldn't have two different themes. It's one theme. And so what are those real quickly, right? It's equality, human equality. Lincoln said that was the central idea of America is human equality. Mm -hmm. Everything else radiates out from that. The emphasis on individual rights, the rights of every human being. These are rights that you have by nature. A government by consent of the governed. And then of course, if government is not acting correctly, if it's illegitimate or, or trying to impose tyranny, then there's the right to revolution, which is not a constitutional right, it is a natural right. And then a corollary, the last thing I talk about in chapter two is what I call the right to rise or what Lincoln called the right to rise or everyone's duty to improve himself or herself. And he got those, he extrapolated that from the idea that if we're all equal, and government is protecting us equally, then what's left to do? Well, work, train, educate, you know, take some risks, et cetera. And as long as you create, if government is creating an equal playing field and it did so progressively over time, remember our government in certain states still allowed for slavery. That's not an even playing field. Um, if yeah. government is doing its job well, 
then the rest remained up to you, right? The land of the free had to be the, the home of the brave, if you will. So the right to rise, Lincoln really valued, because this is a guy who had no more than 12 months of schooling in his entire life. Didn't go to college, law school, high school, you name it. Here's a guy who passed the bar without going to law school. He read the books until somebody thought he knew him enough. Uh, St Stephen Douglas did the same thing, his nemesis. So that's chapter two. The chapter two spells out essentially the aims or the purposes of government. Chapter three right. is the means, the structures. And where do we find the mechanisms of freedom? The constitution. And so Lincoln's reverence for the constitution is what I talk about in chapter three. Now, chapter four, you'll see that these don't work just in chron chronology. There's a logic to it. There's an architecture to it. Mm -hmm. You can't right. read the declaration and then the constitution and not realize, hmm, some of these pieces don't fit. Well, the big piece that didn't fit, what Lincoln called the great behemoth of danger was slavery. And so what did Lincoln learn from the founders about how they addressed the problem of slavery? Something they thought was evil, but they couldn't get rid of right away. What did they try to do to put it, as Lincoln said, on the course of ultimate extinction? So chapter four is a really important chapter because it talks about what everybody has a problem with today, and they should. Slavery at the founding, right? How could they say equality, equality, rights, rights, consent, consent, and deny all of that in practice to a particular portion of their population, okay? So chapter four deals with that. And chapter five, which is a shorter chapter, deals with uh, Lincoln's understanding of what we today call original intent. Um, how do we look to the past? How much should we value it? And are we allowed to tinker with it? Are we allowed, is it possible that we could improve on it? What would experience show us or progress? Uh, uh, what, 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 um, what might we learn along the, uh, along the way that could give us reason to do something differently? So that's just the overall uh, take on the book. Now, did you want me to jump into Washington or? Yeah, yeah, I, but I also want to uh, include, uh, Professor, that you also have a conclusion and it uh, yes. answers a question that many people ask. And I actually saw that Heather Cox Richardson, Professor Heather Cox Richardson, actually did a, a show on it yesterday, who I follow and, uh, and, and admire of her uh, work. But uh, it's your yours is the conclusion, which is Lincoln and the question as a conservative liberal or a liberal conservative. Right, and of course, and of course, uh, you you the the question is what is conserving conservatism, and Lincoln said it's preserving the old against the new, and that's very concise and it's very very accurate. The the key thing but, here, though, of course, is you can't um, you have to know something ahead of that, and that's why yes. that comes at the end. In other words, it's not enough to say, well, be conservative. Uh, in the sense that you just hold on to the past. When we look at the past, as I show in my book, we see some things that are highly valuable, still important, eternally true, uh, but we also see things we don't like. And so the question becomes, as a conservative, if you call yourself a conservative, what of our past do you want to hold on to? What do you conserve? Are we simply following traditions? Because there were some traditions that we should never have begun. <laughs> there were some traditions right. that we inherited and slavery was one of them, right? It was legal in right. all the colonies. And then six of mm -hmm. the original 13 finally got rid of it. Vermont comes yep. in with an abolitionist, if you will, constitution, slavery is not permitted. Um, how mm -hmm. did that change happen? The Americans through their struggle with Great Britain figured out, wow, some of the things we're trying to do as a free people are inconsistent with how we're being governed by Great Britain and even inconsistent with some of our own practices. And it took time. Uh, a great professor from Harvard, Harvey, Harvey Mansfield said, the mm. American founding couldn't be perfect. So did that right. mean we shouldn't have founded it at all? No, yeah. if it had to be a progressive thing, not progressive with a capital P. It's not Wilsonian in that sense. It's progressive in the sense that we established the structures on the right principles. And over time, those principles, as Lincoln put it, Will, will take effect as fast as circumstances shall permit. And so that the enforcement of the things by consent that we hold to be true about equality and rights, that's gonna happen over time. That's gonna happen progressively. That's gonna happen as public opinion is shaped, the very thing that we're doing, I hope, right now. So conservatives, yes, let's hold on to things, but not everything. And that's where the role of reason 
political philosophy, if you will, that's where the role of principles are important. Mm -hmm. Without principles, conservatives simply just do, they really are just maintainers of the status quo. And that's great if you're in a, if you're the elite, that's great if you're in a position of prominence and status and power and wealth, but what about the rest of us, right? Yeah, yeah, very true. Now let me, uh, let's go back to uh, chapter one. I just want to read a couple of statements and then you take it from there. So Lincoln said in his temperance address in 1841, quote, Washington is the mightiest name of earth long since mightiest in the cause of civil liberty, still mightiest in moral reformation. And then Lincoln also alluded to Washington when he left Springfield to come and to be inaugurated as the uh, president of the United States. And he said, quote, I now leave not knowing when or whether ever I may return with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. Take it oh away, my goodness. Professor. Well, you just mentioned two real, I mean, those are two money quotes in that chapter and there's, there's a yeah, lot to right. unpack there. I'll try to do it concisely. Um, Lincoln's citing of Washington and you mentioned moral and you mentioned civil. So and I, I think mm-hmm. those are two very telling words for Lincoln to refer to Washington as still a mighty in terms of moral reformation and a temperance address was about temperance in, in terms of drink, you know, moderating alcohol right. consumption. And so it's yep. a question of character. Washington's character, of course, was, was stellar. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and so um, uh, here's a man known for his bravery, right? Here's a guy who didn't just rule the country. He fought for the country in order for it to be a country. So Washington, his own character, and I, I dare I say his own manliness, um, his bearing, um, his own personal moderation. These were examples to the nation. So, so superlative that Parson Weems even made up stuff like chopping the cherry tree down, right? The guy was neither a parson <laughs> nor a real biographer of, of Washington. He was just trying to sell books and he took the right. most popular politician uh, of his generation and that was George Washington. But the civil yeah. liberty part is important as well. Lincoln recognized that the conception of self-government was in great part due to George Washington. America as a nation. Here's a guy who does not mention the Commonwealth of Virginia in his will as something that he is a citizen of. He says that that he is essentially um, uh, the proprietor of Mount Vernon and a citizen of, uh, he either says America or the United States. So even in his will, he's teaching the country that the nation is more important than your, your, your own state. Okay, so Washington as a a founder of of institutions to protect civil and religious liberty, there is nobody um, to compare to Washington in that respect. So Washington as a leader in morals and Washington as a leader in statesmanship, as a leader in in creating the constitution, right? He presided over the constitution um, and helped shape it. And then he ruled over it for two terms and then decided not to run for a third term. Uh, and that was a huge example that the world had not truly seen. I mean, we have the example of Cincinnatus, of course, which Washington was called Cincinnatus uh, because he right. retired from saving <laughs> his city uh, to become a farmer um, or to return to farming. So I think that both, both the personal example and the political example, the exam- Washington as a man and Washington as a citizen Lincoln held that out to the country as examples to follow. And of course, Washington as a great, um, uh, and I mentioned this by referring to United States, Washington was a union man. He was in favor of union and his great farewell address, which should be read by every kid before he gets out of middle school, his farewell address talked about how the country needed to recognize that yes, there are, we're diverse, we're parochial, we're loyal to our states, but as the nation goes, so goes the states. That that cannot be reversed. Your, the nation has to be more important than than the state. Mm-hmm. Um, and yep. so, I mean, that was Washington's parting words to us. And and his uh, his last parting words were, of course, his last will and testament, where he also emphasizes um, America, the United States. Right. Of course, the tremendous responsibility that Washington took on in founding the nation and getting our constitute democratic constitutional republic up and moving and the states uh united in the, in that purpose 
um, Watt Lincoln understood that the situation he was going into uh, was probably even more critical. Yeah, and, this uh, is he understood uh, that before he even before he went to Washington. Yeah, this is very telling. Um, Lincoln was not, I mean, he is, there's no getting around it. Lincoln was a, a man of, of high morals, but he was also supremely ambitious, no doubt. He wanted to be doing something that will be remembered forever, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. So for him to compare himself to Washington, who he has already told us, nobody compares to Washington, that right. indicates to his listeners, wow, the country is in real trouble. What's yes. the difference between the trouble that Lincoln faced, that the nation faced, that was a, a greater problem to solve politically than the trouble that Washington faced or the crisis that he faced? In Washington's day, Lincoln says, at least there was an external enemy. And all of the reasons you might not like your neighbor and argue with him and maybe even come to blows over, those disappear when the foe is external. All of those mm -hmm. human natural kind of vices and sort of the unsavory characteristics of human beings, uh, their sinful nature, if you will, it's directed to an external foe. And so in a way, even people who wanted to become famous would become famous by serving the cause of liberty, which had never been done before, establishing a self-governing nation. In so in Washington's day, the, the, the task was a little easier because we were united in that enterprise. Uh, the novelty of it. In Lincoln's day, we don't get to do that anymore, right? But in Lincoln's day, we became confused, kind of like today, right? We're undergoing an identity crisis. What does it really mean to be American? What are we, what, what is there common that we believe? What is there common that we are devoted to? It's becoming more confusing. In other words, like 1859, 1860, in Lincoln's day, saving yeah. the union, it turned out, was going to be harder than creating it precisely because the people were no longer united in their understanding of the constitution. They were no longer united in their interpretation of the declaration. This is one thing I discovered after teaching this stuff for 25, 30 years is I mm -hmm. thought, oh, Lincoln was the declaration guy. He was the constitution guy. He loved the founding. I thought that he was kind of su sui generis. I mean, that was unique to him. Turns out Lincoln is arguing a lot about the declaration because other people are doing the same thing and coming to, in his mind, the wrong conclusions, okay? So right. Calhoun is citing it. Jefferson Davis is citing it. Stephen Douglas is citing it. And they are drawing opposite conclusions to what Lincoln mm -hmm. is drawing. And so when, if I've got this book on Lincoln and the founding, that sounds nostalgic or kind of just like kind of scholarly. Well, that's just your thing, Morell. No, what I'm trying to point out and what I discovered is there was a real battle for the founders. Who bears the mantle? Who can truly say, if we all love the founding and people today, of course, not all of them love it, you know, exhibit A, you know, the 1619 project, um, right. we can do a whole other broadcast on that. Um, yes. If we're in some Which sense, if we're in some sense, some sense beholden to the founding, the question now becomes, well, who are the founders? What did they believe? What did they intend, especially given the fact that they didn't give up slavery right away? Lincoln had an interpretation that differed from Stephen Douglas's, that differed from Jefferson Davis's. And so the question mm -hmm. before the American people was, okay, if we're not deciding whether we like the founders or not, we love the founders. The question is, whose rendering is the correct one? And that's mm -hmm. what you see being hashed out in the Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858. And you know he'd mm -hmm. been debating Douglas ever since their days in the state house uh, in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And so that, that to me was, was, was eye-opening. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Uh, let's go on to the next chapter, which we could talk about for a week, which is Lincoln yeah. and the Declaration of Independence and appeal to the founder's ends. Now, uh, Professor, we've talked about uh, the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was created to protect those principles. Mm -hmm. But I love what you bring out in this book is that the Declaration of Independence is an appeal to the founders ends and the Constitution is the means. Yes. And it's so important that they, co that they coordinate and that they're both, they're both important. Let me just uh, read the, from the great speech that he gave in uh, Peoria in 1854 and Lincoln said, let us readopt 
the Declaration of Independence, and with it, the practices and policy which harmonize with it. And that's precisely what we constitutional Republicans believe that the Republican Party needs to proclaim once again. Let's readopt the principles of the Declaration of Independence. They're universal. They're eternal. Yes. They apply to all. People, people believe in them. They think they're right. We need to restore those principles. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say mega dittos. I agree with everything you just said there. Um, we, we really are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we really are facing a, a crisis of identity in America today. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the meaning of America right now is up for grabs. It's, uh, America is being attacked, uh, especially the founders are being attacked, um, and in particular because of the practice of slavery. And mm -hmm. I don't think they have fairly disentangled the practice of slavery and the principles that the founders truly believed in. They thought they've adopted, ironically enough, both Stephen Douglas's opinion and Chief Justice Roger Taney from the Dred Scott opinion mm -hmm. in 1857. They've actually adopted their interpretation of the Constitution and of the Declaration yes. of Independence, more importantly and more Amazing. profoundly. Uh, and what is that interpretation? They said, well, huh, they profess one thing, but do another. Hmm, how do we make sense of this? And Douglas agreed with Tani in saying, because they didn't get rid of slavery immediately, mm -hmm. therefore they must not have meant all men are truly created equal in their possession of the natural rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Lincoln, mm -hmm. in his great Dred Scott speech in 1857, explained how you can say one thing and not immediately act consistently with all those things. And I touched on that a little bit earlier. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the Declaration of Independence, as Lincoln understood it, was an accurate statement of what the founders believed. And anybody who fairly reads the founders, will see that they never justify slavery as right before God or nature. Uh, Jefferson, if you want, if he's exhibit A for people uh, 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 in terms of bad founders because he said equality, but he practiced inequality. You never right, see in right. his writings, his correspondence or his public documents, you know, notes on the state of Virginia, his, state, his statements as a public official, as president, he never justified slavery. And in fact, he said, if the slaves rose up against us, whose side would God take? Jefferson mm. said, not his side, not the side yeah. of the master class. God would take the side of the slaves. And Jefferson warned Virginians and Americans generally that if they didn't figure out a way to uh, get rid of slavery peacefully, that God mm -hmm. might actually, as you put it, by supernatural interference. This is the so-called deist Jefferson right. saying, yeah. I tremble when I consider that God is just, that his justice shall not sleep forever. He says, God mm -hmm. might interfere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he might intervene on the side of the slaves. And of course, Madison, Jefferson, and later folks like Clay, uh, they feared uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, the greatest foreign observer of the United States, democracy in America. They all thought that a servile, what they called a servile war, a slave insurrection, a race war would occur. And because whites outnumbered blacks, the blacks would be massacred as a result. And um, that was a great fear uh, that actually impeded emancipation because they always thought, well, we can't just free them, then what? Those slaves are gonna remember what we did to them. Mm -hmm. Jefferson has this harrowing description in, in, in um, uh, a chapter called On Laws, I think it's query number four, 15, 14 in Notes on the State of Virginia, where he says, mm -hmm. why don't we free them? 10,000 recollections on the part of the blacks, right? Mm -hmm. And then of course the racial bigotry of the whites. So self-preservation on the part of the master class and justice, Jefferson says justice is on the side of the enslaved. And so mm -hmm. um, that is something I don't think people duly uh, wrestle with in terms of what the founders thought. They thought slavery was wrong, bad, evil, but in their minds, they did not believe they could get rid of this long standing institution immediately. And so what did they do? What are the mm -hmm. signs that the founders wanted to get rid of something that they couldn't get rid of right away. Lincoln points to the non-importation clause of the constitution. The constitution said Congress could not ban the importation of slaves until 1808. They don't have to, but that was right. the earliest. 
Guess yeah. what president signs that into law March 1807 to take effect as soon as constitutionally permissible January 1, 1808, Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And then in 1820, they equate the slave trade uh, middle passage with piracy. And the only punishment for piracy, as they said in the old days, hanging by the neck until dead. Capital yeah. punishment, kappa yes. off with their head. So stop the flow and also prevent its expansion. The only territory possessed by the American people in the 1780s was the Northwest Territory. In 1784, yes. Jefferson drafts a version of what will come to be known as the Northwest Ordinance, passed under the Articles of Confederation, and then re in 1787, as we're debating the Constitution, and then under the first Congress, they repass it. What is Article 6, the last article of the Northwest Ordinance? Drawing from Jefferson's draft, slavery is prohibited from the Northwest mm -hmm. Territory. So what are you seeing happening? They're yeah. trying to cabin it. So as the nation expands, slavery does not expand with it. So in our right. mind, yeah, we're not getting rid of slavery right away, but our intention is to prevent it from expanding. If they were irrevocably given over to black enslavement, right? As Nicole Hannah Jones puts it, it's in our D racism is in our DNA. If that were true, Mm -hmm. Why permit Congress to ban the slave importation? Why didn't? Why, why have that Article 6 in Northwest Ordinance? Yeah. Why not let it yeah. spread? Lincoln said these are signs of what they intended that provide the context for why they could continue to, um, at least in some states, uh, allow for slavery to be legal um, uh, in the short run but hopes that it would be put on, as Lincoln put it, the course of ultimate extinction. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing what's been excluded from that 1619 project. And of course, Hannah Nicole Jones is the author of that uh, New York Times uh, piece. So, and, and incidentally for our listeners, uh, Professor Morrell has done videos uh, giving an in-depth uh, re repudiation, if you will, uh, rhetorically uh, against the 1619 project. Of course, we've talked about the inaccuracies and we've read from our friend, Dr. Alan Gelzo has also put articles out uh, on that. But I did yes. want to touch on before we move, before we move on, Professor Lincoln's remark that uh, he said in Springfield, 1857, he said, they, meaning the founders, meant to set up a standard maxim for free society, which of course was the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. which should be familiar to all and revered by all, constantly looked to, constantly labored for it, and even though never perfectly attained, approximated and thereby constantly spreading and deepening its influence and augmenting the happiness and virtue of life to all people of all of colors. colors everywhere. So there's Lincoln taking the argument to what the founders really meant by the Declaration of Independence as opposed to what um, Stephen Douglas and the, really the, the, the beginning of progressivism really occurred with the Confederacy. If, if so I had, see Lincoln. Yeah, if I could quote one paragraph of all of Lincoln's writings in terms of his explication, his, his um, exe, exegesis, I'm trying to try to find a mm -hmm. word that's not Greek, um, his explanation <laughs> or interpretation of that second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, it's that one paragraph in the speech you just quoted. And that's his Dred Scott speech from um, June of 1857, where he right. explains why they could say one thing, they could declare something and enforce it. He makes a distinction between the declaration of these self-evident truths and enforcement, as he puts it, as fast as circumstances shall permit, which ends with that ringing um, sentence that you just Quoted that one paragraph should be in gold. Um, it is. It is the, it is the best thing written by anyone who wasn't a founder about what the founding was about, and it involves slavery. It's a tremendous paragraph. Right. Now, let me ask you this, uh, Professor. Um, one of the quotes, uh, what, really the statement of authority that the founders used to justify uh, their uh, really entitling them to a separation from. Um, the crown of Britain were the laws of nature and nature's God. Yes. And we read about, and we read about Lincoln's great reverence for the law and order. Um, what did, what did Lincoln, did Lincoln ever say anything or did he ever elaborate on the laws of nature and nature's God as being really the first major principle of the Declaration of Independence, right? 
Yeah, with, with Lincoln, you've got something uh, interesting. Um, he is Lockean. He's not just a, 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 a Lockean, but he, and by Lockean, I mean um, someone who's influenced by the Enlightenment, John Locke, and that the great text, Second Treatise on Civil Government. He never read Locke. He didn't like reading works of philosophy and political philosophy. He didn't read novels. He read Shakespeare, he read poetry, and he read economics. Yeah. If you can believe this, his favorite subject to read next to Shakespeare in the Bible was political economy. Okay, go figure. Uh -huh. Anyway, so how did he get his luck? He got his luck through Jefferson by uh -huh. reading Jefferson's writings and principle among those is the declaration. Now, laws of nature and nature's God, that's lifted. I mean, Jefferson wishes he coined that phrase. That's lifted right out of Locke's second treatise. You know, long train right. of abuses and usurpations. That's in the second paragraph. That's also lifted word for word out of the second treatise on civil government. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Lincoln never... Um, he didn't, he didn't cite chapter and verse Locke because he didn't read Locke, but he learned from Jefferson and he learned from Washington and he learned from the declaration that the laws of nature and nature's God are the laws that govern uh, the moral economy of the universe, if you will. And so um, uh, what do we mean by the laws of nature, natural law? What do we mean by the laws of nature's God? Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's not the God of the Bible or the God of the Quran, for that matter. What it means is what we can discern about God. And Thomas West, Professor West up at Hillsdale is great on this. There is a natural mm -hmm. theology in the Declaration of Independence. Unlike the French Revolution, right. where they took God out, that was atheistic. The United mm -hmm. States Revolution, which came earlier, was theistic. Mm -hmm. Four references to God in the Declaration of Independence. And it's uh, uh, many... Uh, political philosophers have pointed out God is referenced in, in kind of like the three branches of government. He's a lawgiver, he's an executor yep. or an executive, yep. and he's a judge. So you got all three branches of the government there. Interesting. Yep. Uh, but the point being, laws of nature, nature's God is this is Lincoln's discerning using his reason uh, of the moral economy of the universe. And his understanding is that individual rights were rights that people possess by nature. Mm -hmm. If you notice the language of the Declaration of Independence, it doesn't mention government until it describes who human beings are qua human. In other words, as mm -hmm. human beings. Once, mm -hmm. in other words, we understand what a human being is, equal, it's reciprocal. Nobody's better or worse, superior or inferior in terms of their possession of rights. Uh, um, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, and therefore you can't rule them without their permission. So government by right. consent. But he says, look at the language of the declaration. It says that to secure these rights, not to grant them, not to give them, not bestow them, and they're not privileges. Right. To secure, as I put it to my students, to protect what you already have as a human being. Mm -hmm. If you're a human, zzz, you got them. I don't care, what, male, female, I don't care. Religion, I don't care. Black, white, I don't care. Are you human? Mm -hmm. You got them. You were, that's why we refer to them as birthright. Okay. Government's job, therefore, is to step in and put a wall around each one of our things. And the most principal one is, is my right to life, my right to liberty, which includes labor, and my right to pursue happiness. Government doesn't grant you happiness because it can't. That is a human thing, that is right. an act of the will. That requires families, it requires habits, it requires educating mind and heart, character, okay? So Lincoln's understanding of that, he got naturally, if you will, simply by reflecting on yeah. these principles that are discernible to any rational creature. And, and that's the way right. the declaration lays out, it, it lays out its argument, right? It says, let facts be submitted to a candid world. It says a mm -hmm. decent respect to the opinions of mankind require mm -hmm. that we explain what we're doing, right? Well, why do you explain it unless you're trying to persuade, unless you're trying to justify your action? So Lincoln all, right. got that all without reading John Locke, but it is very Lockean. Right. Now, pick up on what you said, Professor, about consent. In the book, you say that consent is the flip side of the equality coin. Yes. This is very important, and I was, I was found this very important, so please elaborate on the consent the word so, consent is used in Declaration so of Consent is one of the things that the Second, the Second Continental Congress used in terms of the language 
that they used for Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence, uh, government by consent of the governed. Um, if we understand that all men are created equal, all human beings are created, if you will, equally human, okay? Mm -hmm. Then by definition, no man, and here I'm cribbing from my great mentor, um, Harry Jaffa, no man is the natural born ruler of anyone but himself. That's a very Jeffersonian statement in principle. Mm -hmm. So if it's mm -hmm. true that nobody can tell you what to do except for you, well, how can we pass laws then? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can submit to a law that I have done what to, that I have given you permission to impose on me. And that's a product of the social compact. That's a product of mm -hmm. civil government, civil society, because we realize if we stay in the state of nature, again, this is John Locke, if we all try to secure our rights on our own, it's gonna be chaos, it's gonna be anarchy, and eventually a few people will rule not by right, but according to might. To move beyond that state of war, we create civil government, government by permission. And when you do that, you give up the right to tell yourself what to do. You allow the community to tell you what to do. Those are laws in hopes that you're gonna get a better protection of that which you possess by nature than if you were to go it alone, like on Gilligan's Island, just like release 10,000 people and say, good luck with that. No, pretty soon if they wanted to enjoy the fruits of their labor, they would recognize that the best way to do things is to agree not to infringe on each other in terms of what we already possess equally. Those are our mm -hmm. rights, but the only way to rule them by uh, uh, legitimately is the flip side, is by their permission, consent. So my, it's my way of saying equality implies that the only legitimate form of government is government by consent. It's the flip side of the consent coin. Uh, flip side of the, the flip side of the equality coin, equality and consent. You can't, you can't try to split a coin in half. You still have two sides, don't you? That's you right. they, one goes with the other. You can't have the one without the other. Yeah, that really, that really made me think totally differently about the idea of consent and really, really solidifies that. And we want to continue to teach people that. Now right. we're getting close to the end, but I just want to touch on the uh, Lincoln and the Constitution for a moment. Sure. And the fact is, is that Lincoln said, you know, we don't need to explain professor very quickly as he took over the office of president, he was very reluctant to do anything to change the constitution. But of course, then as the war went on, he started to think about the 13th amendment and uh, habeas corpus and, and these sort of things. So just right. give us a little background on that. So yeah, what change. that chapter spells out is that not in, in general and in principle, it spells out Lincoln's connection between the Declaration and the Constitution and the Union of the States. He thought of the Constitution and the Union of the States as, as, a, as twins, as it were. Uh, but they, right. as much as he valued those, they were means towards something higher. He thought hierarchically. Mm -hmm. In this way, he's kind of more like Aristotle. Um, these were means to a higher end. And when we lose sight of the right. end, or we have an incorrect interpretation of that end as Stephen Douglas did. Oh, all mm -hmm. white people are created equal, okay? Mm -hmm. um, or as Calhoun thought, right? Whites get to rule blacks and it's good for the whites and the blacks, go figure, okay? Um, Lincoln wanted Americans to recognize that as important as the constitution and as important as the states sticking together, if we lost sight of the goal, which were individual rights, or as he put it, liberty to all, that would become a union not worthy of the saving. Mm -hmm. He said the only way to preserve union, he said this in that great speech in, at Peoria in 1854, the only, uh, um, the way to preserve a union worthy of the saving is a union that is informed, a constitution that is interpreted according to the moral lights spelled out in the Declaration of Independence, okay? Now, when mm -hmm. he assumes office, he has said, you know, he has preached what he called a political religion, reverence for the constitution and laws. When he assumes office, of course, the nation is splitting. You've got citizens of seven states who do not believe they're Americans anymore. They have formed in their minds a confederacy. They have seceded. Mm -hmm. And then after the, the firing on Fort Sumter and Lincoln calls out the militia in response to that, Virginia, Arkansas, and two other states that escape me right now, it was in North Carolina and Tennessee, I forget. But by the time July, but by the time um, May and June roll around, eleven states are mm -hmm. no longer a part 
of the United States constitutional order in their minds. They have sworn off allegiance. They have revoked their approval, as they, they put it. Right. Lincoln doesn't want to touch the Constitution. He doesn't think the states have left. He treats it as a gigantic rebellion, as he called it. <coughs> yep. But when he is compelled to emancipate slaves as a means to preserving union, mm -hmm. it turns out you, you to emancipate slaves doesn't get rid of slavery. The war could come to an end, and the laws on the books and in the Constitution of those slave states are still there. So Lincoln said, mm -hmm. we really haven't gotten rid of the problem. The only way to truly get rid of the problem, what he called a king's cure for, for, for all evils, um, was to amend the Constitution. But notice here, the 13th Amendment was, an, uh, was a change of the Constitution that simply made explicit mm -hmm. the purposes, the mission statement that's spelled out in the preamble, right? The blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. All it did was right. bring to fruition what the founders could not do at the time. Mm -hmm. but intended the nation to do, which is in our full flowering, we would be a truly free republic, not a slaveholding one. And so I would say that even when he agreed and lobbied hard to amend the Constitution, the, which became the 13th Amendment, he did not think he was doing anything to change fundamentally the spirit of the Constitution, which is uh, as... as uh, um, Frederick Douglass called it a glorious liberty document. Right. So the, the, the general point of his reverence for the constitution, he says, if we start messing with the constitution, well, A, he didn't think it could be improved. Uh, we, we couldn't get the union, but for those compromises, so we can't touch that. But he says, if yeah. we get in the habit of changing or the supreme law of the land, we'll stop thinking about and therefore acting in a way consistent with self-government. And self-government, if when you think about it, really means what? Self-control. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln was worried that people in their pursuit of something as good as justice mm -hmm. might think the rule of law is too slow. The gears of governments and courts just grind too slowly. I know, mm -hmm. hang that guy at, you know, at the nearest tree. And Lincoln said, we can't think like that. That in our pursuit of justice, it has to be done by submitting to the rule of law. In submitting to the rule yeah. of law, we are actually submitting to the rule of reason. That mm -hmm. slowness is a way to temper our passions. It's a way to slow down our emotions. And if what we really want to do that we're all fired up about rah, moral righteous indignation, then if it's truly right and we return to our senses, which is to say our reason, that good will come about as a result of majority rule and court edicts, et cetera. A resort to mob rule, mob violence, lynch law is simply a resort to um, the rule of the might as opposed to the rule of right, the rule of our passions rather than the rule of reason. And so for me, consent is captured by the rule of law. Consent is captured by our submission to these mechanisms of freedom, as I call them, the rule of law, because in submitting to that, what we're actually saying is I need to submit or, or, or um, uh, constitute <laughs> my emotions uh, in, in obedience to my reason. It's as as, it's as um, what, what Madison put it in Federalist 10, right? To refine mm -hmm. and enlarge the public's views. It's not to replace mm -hmm. them, it's to refine them. It's to enlarge them, see the big picture, see the common good rather than my mere self-interest. Um, so yeah, right. I think that's, that's, where the, that's really important. That's where the right makes might makes sense. Yes. Uh, what, what right is what, that's the ultimate objective, what is right and what is lawful. Now, Really, uh, uh, Professor, that, that would be a great way to end the program, but I just want to let the people know that the next chapter, uh, Lincoln and Slavery, an Appeal to the Founders Compromise, we've discussed quite a bit today, but you're going to want to, you're going to get some great information out of that. But uh, just very quickly, Lincoln and the original intent appeal to the Founders' re relevance. And in there, you're, you're talking about Lincoln's um, rebuttal of Taney's uh, decision and Dred Scott, and really... Uh, creating the foundation for the originalism versus living constitutional dichotomy that we have today, correct? Yes, um, I, I bring up original intent and I, I try to do it in a way that's not anachronistic. I try not to you know, import a debate uh, or, or some kind of policy contention that we're hung up on today, right? With the impeachment of Trump, right? All of a sudden right. they discovered original intent. All the liberals fi finally decided it was worth reading what those guys said. Right, lawyer uh -huh. after lawyer, and they're very good. 
Uh, but yeah. of course, it, they, they were all about con original intent when it's on their side. And I mean, to right. be true, conservatives do the same thing, right? Uh, the, the justices of the court, the Federalist Papers are important when it helps them and when it doesn't, right. they're not mentioned at all, right? What happened to their authority? Anyway, yeah. uh, so the, I, I went back and I read Lincoln and lo and behold, in that Cooper Institute address, that February 1860 mm -hmm. speech that put Lincoln on the map in a serious yeah. way in a, if, to contend for the presidency, um, he talks about the original purposes, the original intent, um, uh, what, what, how should we view uh, the, the founders? And he disagrees with Tawny. People who criticize original intent today, they always bring up the Dred Scott case because nobody likes the Dred Scott case. It's the worst Supreme Court opinion in history, you know, next to maybe Roe v. Wade, in my opinion. Right, uh, right. Tawny there said, oh, yeah, we can't look at, at opinions of slavery in our time. We have to look back at the founding and guess what we learned there, according to Tawny and his awful history, it's bad right. history. He says, yeah. well, the founders didn't free their slaves. So I guess all didn't mean all. Same opinion mm. that Stephen Douglas had. So Lincoln said, no, 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 no. It's not that looking back to the founders is, is an incorrect way of understanding the constitution. You have to have a correct understanding of that history. And Tawney mm -hmm. ignored a correct understanding. It was spelled out to him by Benjamin Curtis in one of the dissents. Tawney withheld his opinion, which he read verbatim. It took hours in March. He got everybody else's opinions, read those, especially the two dissents by McLean and Curtis. And then in May, I think April or May, he added 16 or so pages to his opinion. And having read Curtis, he completely ignored where Cur Curtis pointed out, did you know that black people could actually vote in North Carolina and four Northern states at the time the constitution mm -hmm. was being ratified? And we can presume they actually did vote and send delegates mm -hmm. to ratify, et cetera. And so even with the correct history, Tawney ignored it. So what you see in Tawney by reading Lincoln is not that originalism is wrong. It was originalism, it was malpractice. It was originalism misapplied because his history was bad. And that's why Lincoln was hoping that they could get another case in front of the court where they could correct that mistake. But then of course the war broke out. Right. Well, Professor, uh, we've come to the end of our time, but I want to show everyone this is the book that you want to go out and get, Constitutional Republicans. It's a must, but all Americans, all Americans should go out and get this wonderful book, Lincoln and the American Founding. And I want to thank you, Professor, so much for giving us your time. I hope that you'll come back and join us again Gotta do for it. another new Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation. All the best to you, and I would ask all of our watchers and listeners and viewers to please share this video and uh, educate others and inform others about Professor Morell's great book, Lincoln and the American Founding. Thank you so much, Professor. We could talk for days, but we've yeah. got hard time limits. And I thank you so much for joining me, and we'll be in touch soon. Excellent. And thank remember, you, we always end our programs, Professor, with what, Liber with what Lincoln said, liberty for all. Liberty Thank you. for all. Thank you. Take care. Take care.